Say the words race riot, and most people think you're talking about this place, Cronulla Beach. That's the blip we'd like to forget. Outrageous, disgraceful, completely un-Australian, right? Wrong. For more than 170 years, mobs of every race have stabbed, bashed, shot at each other over just who belongs and who rules. Come with me to discover a secret history that'll shock and surprise you. Race riots have defined us. Sometimes they've reformed us. It's not only the great and the good, but the mob that's shaped the nation. and the story so far. Australia is not yet Australia. This is a place that since the time of the First Fleet has borne witness to constant and deadly fighting between the British colonists and the first Australians. This is a society that established itself by force and, and um, it manages itself by force. You could only do what the British did if you fundamentally believed that the space you were entering was not a space occupied by your race or human beings at all. Around the continent, the first Australians fiercely resist the British in waves of frontier violence. But by the 1840s, the colonists largely controlled New South Wales and Victoria. And in fledging towns like Melbourne, another kind of racial violence appears. Battles, not for sovereignty, but for opportunity. Riots are always about who we think we are and what we want to be. By 1846, we no longer want to be a dumping ground for British riffraff. Now, boatloads of free immigrants outnumber those in chains. Ready to make the colony a success, the arrivals include ruling class Protestants, typically English or Scottish, but also a growing number of Irish Catholics, the hated outsiders. Now, they may have the same skin colour and even be from the same geographical area, but in 1846, these two cultures are so alien to each other that a Catholic in a British-run colony can be as unwelcome as someone with a burqa will be later on, in 2005, on Cronulla Beach. To describe the Irish as a different ethnicity, maybe to us might seem a little strange, but at the time, I think there was an understanding that they were a different race. Irish Catholics were seen as having a primary allegiance to Rome or to Irish nationalism, but definitely not to the British Empire, and therefore they were to be feared, mistrusted, and even hate it. Breakfast with Alan Jones on 2GB. And just like the riot at Cronulla, back in 1846, there's a rabble rouser stirring up trouble in the media. The Alan Jones of his day is a newspaper man. 34-year-old Scottish immigrant William Kerr expects to do well on arriving in the colony. He expects to be listened to. After all, he's a well-educated Protestant, and in his view, that automatically makes him a member of the ruling class. But it's not so straightforward. Because by now, there are thousands of Catholics competing for the spoils of this new colony. This is Broughton Hall, or Tara, as it's named by John O'Shaughnessy, an Irish Catholic who builds it at the height of his career. By 1846, John O'Shaughnessy is making a name for himself about town. He set up a draper's shop, and after just one year in business, it's thriving. He's also got himself elected to Melbourne Council. He's demonstrating that to make it in this colony, all you need is a bit of gumption, a bit of get up and go, and he's got them in plenty. He is, in short, exactly the kind of uppity mick that newspaper man William Kerr can't stand. The changing balance of racial power 
means that the old order cannot continue. But what the new order will be, nobody knows. In Kerr's mind, Catholics have bloodthirsty designs to overthrow Protestant authority. His Argus newspaper, like Talkback Radio, is the perfect place to rant. William Kerr's attacks on the Catholics range throughout his press. He really divides and drums up sectarianism within the colony. Now, Kerr's at pains to point out that the Argus is not against Catholics per se, but if they will insist on hanging around in unthinking mobs or committing outrages at the racecourse, then we seek neither Irish friendship nor immunity from Irish enmity. Subtext, if you weren't so damn Catholic, we'd get along fine. What's at stake is who is entitled to the future of this city. The immigrants can feel it in their bones. This place has the chance to be prosperous. The question is, who has the muscle to lead it to that success? Who is gonna own this town? Newspaper man William Kerr is hell-bent like a mad thing on keeping old bigotries alive. So he and his Protestant friends form a colonial chapter of ye old institution, the Orange Lodge. Every year they have a party in July, celebrating the notorious Battle of the Boyne, where the Catholics were defeated in Ireland in 1690. They have toasts uh, that pillory the Pope. The only purpose of it is to go, nya, 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 we be Jew. And it's like hundreds of years on, get over it. So the Irish Catholics are not going to take that line down. We've all heard the expression, like a red rag to a bull. Well, Orange also packs a punch. And it was there at what used to be the pastoral hotel, the Protestants' watering hole, festooned in Orange banners, that the riot bursts into life. You often find that at the centre of a right is some hated symbol. In this particular conflict, the orange flag is a very potent symbol of the enemy. It provides a focal point that galvanises the energies and vexations of the crowd. On the streets outside, this Protestant piss-up, the inevitable happens. Some Catholics spot the billowing orange banners and from all over town they come. As the evening draws in, a Tipperary mob makes haste to get to the pastoral hotel. They're armed with clubs, guns, and centuries of hate. And among them, who's this? The rising star of the business community, John O'Shannessy. O'Shannessy's presence galvanizes the angry mob. Any orange man is fair game. Then, the most important Protestant in Melbourne shows up. The mayor starts pounding on the door, demanding that the Orange Order let him in. But when the door opens, the Catholic mob surges past and a furious fight takes place inside. Outside, the armed Catholics start firing at the windows, quickly drawing return fire. It's on! Bullets ping everywhere. Suddenly, movement in one of the upstairs windows. A pistol pointed at whom? A man at the cloth? A Catholic priest trying to calm his flock down? Kill him and the town will burn. As the Melbourne riot of 1846 plays out, it's clear that both the Protestants hold up inside the Loyalist Hotel and the Catholics swarming from outside are angry and dangerous. They use pistols a lot like these. Tony Gold. Peter, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So how would you load these guns? The first procedure is putting the powder in. Yep which you then tip into the barrel. Right. And you jam the ball down right. on top of the powder. So by this point, we've got gunpowder down below. That's we've correct. got the ball on top. Do you cock it? Well, there's another procedure. With the old right. flintlock pistols, you had to then put an igniter yep. in the pan. 
getting complicated. It is getting complicated. Um, I can't feel like feel that the baddies aren't getting away, but come on, well, you go on. Well, the, the ones on the other side have got the same problem. Right. So you put a finer grade of powder in here. Yes. Then you close the pan. Then you cock it. You fire it then. You see the spark that comes off the prison? Yes. Is that the origin of the expression flash in the pan? When nothing else happens, yes. Right. It's it just a flash, flash in the, the pan. pan. At the Pastoral Hotel, old world celebrations are turning into new world carnage. The town's Catholic priest is in mortal danger. A gun wielding Protestant takes aim. The Catholic mob's ringleader, John O'Shaughnessy, bounds forward and pushes the good father out of the way. A Catholic bystander cops the shot instead. The two tribes destroy the pastoral hotel. Where are the police, you may ask? Good question. Chief Constable Sugden has a problem. He's a Protestant, but all bar one of his men are Catholics. And as he writes in his official report, I could not prevail upon my men to act. The mayor visits both warring camps and reads them the Riot Act. In the name of the sovereign, you will disperse. Remarkably, they do. Two men die, one from a devastating wound in his leg. And he's got a nasty gunshot to his thigh. It's infected. He's going to need an amputation. And they would have cut his leg off without any anaesthetic. So it would have been a particularly horrible and gruesome thing to go through. But the extraordinary thing about this riot is the response to it. 170 years before Alan Jones incites hatred of Lebanese Muslims during the Cronulla riots, his historical counterpart, newspaper man William Kerr, also lays blame squarely on the outsider. But amazingly, his is not the general reaction. The Australian says... To celebrate the defeat on that day of the Irish is neither kind nor just. The two nations are now one. The Courier follows up, saying that both sides must take responsibility for what has happened. There's a consistent theme developing here, that it's time for conciliation, for getting along together, that in the new world, we must do things in a new way. We have to find a way to get along. In the mop-up, John O'Shaughnessy is found guilty of assault. However, noting his attack could have been provoked by the colour orange, the government passes a new law. It forbids the display of emblems or colours that incite violence. In other words, everyone deserves a fair go. This new colony or colonies will be set up in a way that we are as good as the old world, if not better. For John O'Shaughnessy, the riot acts as a turning point. He goes on to enjoy an illustrious political career and becomes Premier three times. He tells his followers to remember that they are Australians and that the importing of old world agitations does no good. The Irish Catholics of Melbourne, however, aren't above a final dig. After the 1846 riots, they raise enough money to buy the pastoral hotel, the Protestant watering hole and site of all the trouble, and rename it the Harp of Erin. So, in the first great Australian race riot, there is bloodshed. But after the dust settles and the blood dries, there's something else. A growing desire for the different races to rub along together. What could possibly derail such a very fine start? Eighteen fifty-one, Melbourne, 
The colony is mad. Gold has been discovered in the Victorian bush. Huge swathes of humanity head for the hills. The streets explode with a cavalcade of carts filled with tents, tools and people with big dreams. They come from New Zealand, the British Isles, Europe, India and China. We probably can't imagine today what it was like on the gold fields. The sudden influx of population, tens of thousands of people arriving in Melbourne. There was no immigration control, no restrictions on whether people were British, Chinese or what they were. Uh, it was just anyone who could get to Australia who came for the gold. Just as gold weaves its way through layers of rock, so too the foraging miners spread out all over the colony looking for that shiny metal. In 1857, this isolated valley in northeastern Victoria is filled with thousands of gold seekers. So you've made it. Where are we? Yeah, we're back in time in the middle of the Buckland Valley. It's still essentially the same bush as it was 150 years ago. you basically got a town of tents, both sides of the river, just tent, 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 diggings, diggings, diggings. Absolutely. Literally thousands of tents in that very really? initial period. Over 6,000 men. Yep. All crammed in about a 20-mile stretch. This whole valley is full of stories and tales of those early miners. Can I see? Absolutely. Come this way and we'll go and squeeze. Amongst the Fossicky miners is a 26-year-old from Canton called Pan Look. He opens a general store and has high hopes for what he'll find in the land the Chinese have dubbed Sinchin Shan, the new golden mountain. But all is not what it seems. The British Crown has just done a deal with the Emperor of China, saying, we're going to take a piece of you, and in return, you're going to have free movement of Chinese citizens within the empire. But they haven't really told the Australians that that's what they've done, or in particular, haven't thought through what the consequences of that might be. Pan Look and his countrymen settled into the unforgiving bush under the resentful eye of the established European miners. It's the first time that they've really seen someone, probably, who's, who's so totally different. There's a lot of curiosity. Why are they eating with chopsticks? The language that they're speaking is totally different. And the way Chinese people are dressing, wearing the queue, the plait. Multiculturalism, cultures living side by side. It, it, it's a totally alien concept. While it's every man for himself amongst the Europeans, the Chinese work in gangs. And when the gold panning starts to dwindle, they take the initiative and start sinking their own shafts. Just be careful here, Peter. Well, it certainly will be. Yeah, <laughs> it's a bit of a oh, drop. <laughs> bloody hell. That is unbelievable. I can barely see the bottom. How deep is that? Oh, it should be a good 20 feet deep. And am I right in saying because it is circular, that's how you know it was dug by the Chinese, broadly? Yeah, generally speaking, the Ch Chinese dug the round shafts mm. because they're much more structurally sound than, say, a rectangular shaft. They also say that no spirits would dwell in corners being a round shaft. But when they start doing this, it's like almost a statement of intent. We're here and we're serious. Well, it, well, sinking shafts signified these fellows opening up new ground that no one had worked before, and European miners felt intimidated by that because this ground is ground that they hoped to work later on, but the Chinese were opening it up for, instead. They knew that there were 300 million Chinese in China and only about one million people in Australia. They were aware of that, and they continued to be aware of that. So they were competitors with this very small, predominantly British population. At the same time that Pan Look arrives in Victoria to try his luck on the gold fields, a young American miner by the name of Henry Morgan also turns up. Henry's great pleasure is writing. He fills his pages with the minutiae of life in the Buckland diggings. 1st of March, 1857, Sunday, the first melon of the season we ate today. But the true historical value of this story 
is found in the fact that he chronicles the growing tensions between the European and the Chinese miners. 8th of May 1857, the Chinese at the junction last night had their tents torn down and some of them much hurt. There is much strife between the white and Chinese populations. I'm just looking at my watch. It's 1857. And I'm looking out here and I can see this whole place is lit up. Fires, lanterns. 1857, there are at least two and a half thousand miners here. And in their minds, the gold fields offered them an opportunity to shed that masters and servant type background yeah. and be their own bosses. The white men feel the valley is theirs. But it's home now for the Chinese too who, after only a few months, adorned the Buckland with a magnificent new building, a Joss House Temple. The building itself is probably one of the smartest buildings on the Buckland, about 20 foot long and 14 foot wide. It had floorboards and it had the grand altars. <laughs> the European diggers had been on the Buckland for, you know, four years and hadn't built a place of worship. The Chinese, they were here in large numbers, they'd built their Joss house and they were going to work the Buckland really hard for its gold. By now, Chinese success seems unstoppable. But as the winter closes in, the reaction from some Europeans will be unimaginable. of July 1857. For the American diggers, it's Independence Day and it's cold. Henry Morgan records in his diary six inches of snow have fallen in just the last few days. And he hints at one other thing. Trouble is brewing and he wants no part of it. He heads for the hills to chop wood to be well away from what exactly? Up the valley, some miners are in the mood for special festivities. In just a few months, their Buckland Valley has been transformed. The Chinese now outnumber them three to one. It's a tipping point. I think most outsiders perceive riots as chaotic, meaningless acts of destructiveness. For the participants themselves, often they're exactly the opposite. They're joyous, meaningful, celebrations. In fact, the best way to think of a riot, I think, psychologically, is, a, is a, a kind of identity festival in which we discover who we are and we kind of celebrate that in public. At the pub up the valley, a mob of rowdy white miners are intent on reclaiming what's theirs. There's an ultimatum. Either the whites go or the Chinese go. Hear, 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 hear. There's a thunderous round of applause and a call to arms. They grab picks and shovels and even rip the fence palings from outside the hotel. Then about 40 men head up the right-hand fork of the river. The Chinese miners find themselves pelted with stones and told to clear off or their tents will burn. The Chinese flee down river. So, job done. The fury of the mob spent in victory? Strangely, no. For it only gets worse from here. Eighteen fifty seven, deep in the Victorian gold fields. Resentments have turned to riot. The sheer steepness of the Buckman River Valley has enormous bearing on how the riot plays out. As the Chinese are fleeing the white mob behind, they've got sheer cliffs on both sides, so there's nowhere to go but to continue downstream. As they do, the white mob gets bigger and bigger as more and more white miners join in the magnetic madness, in turn flushing out more and more Chinese from their camps until this full river of rage is flowing down the valley. For five hours, the brutality continues, destroying everything in its path, everything Chinese. 
All the violence is reported in gory detail. A Chinaman who refuses to hand over his gold ring has his fingers sliced. Any sympathetic European, like Elizabeth Arlene, the Scottish wife of a Chinese miner, is attacked. Her forehead much cut and her eyes blackened. Pan Luk's store is totally destroyed. 300 Chinese tents are trashed and ashed. And then the angry mob herds the Chinese like sheep down the valley. In every riot, rioters need a potent symbol on which to focus their energies. That might be a line of police, a barricaded door or a banner. In the case of the miners at Buckland River, it's the symbol of the stranger amongst them. On this hill stood the shiny new Chinese Joss House Temple, just four days old and now a target. As part of the process of driving Chinese off the gold fields, you don't leave a Joss house standing so that people can come back and still worship there. It's important to get rid of it and to erase it from the landscape. And those events are not random. What gets targeted, what gets affected by the riot is ultimately testament to the meaningfulness of what has taken place. By destroying the place in which the ancestors are remembered, you are doing enormous painful damage to the social solidarity of the Chinese themselves, emotionally, psychologically, You're harming them, signaling to them that this is just the beginning. The flames, in a sense, act as a beacon as to where things are going to go. No one really knows how many Chinese died as a result of the riot. In the immediate aftermath, the bodies of three males are found. Seven weeks later, a fourth body, badly decomposed, is discovered floating down the Buckland River. And for years afterwards, rumours persist of Chinese corpses thrown into mine shafts or buried on bleak hillsides. please. On the 8th of August 1857, in an atmosphere of deepening racial resentment, 12 white miners face Beechworth Court on charges of rioting, theft and assault. Counsel, call your witness. The prosecution calls lip tip, Your Honour. In Australia, the Chinese miners were within the legal system. A Chinese person could testify in a court of law against a European. Five Chinese miners take the stand, most of whom give their oath the Chinese way. When somebody is not Christian, there are different methods to ensure that they say the truth. Things like blowing out a match or um, killing a chicken. If you don't tell the truth, you'll die like the chicken or you'll be blown out like the match. A sharpshooting lawyer from Melbourne, Townsend McDermott, has been called in to defend the accused rioters. It's a flawed system from the very beginning. We've got a European jury drawn from the local population and about a third of the population is implicated in what happened. We have to give the government credit for at least trying to bring these people to justice, but people were well aware that if a fair trial went ahead, that there would have been violent repercussions. Elizabeth Arlene states she saw one of the white miners beat one of the Chinese with a stick, chase his victim into the river while calling, we'll drown the bastards. Lawyer McDermott warns the jury, any woman who would marry a Chinaman shows a character of such moral degradation as to warrant not the slightest confidence being placed in her evidence. Only four of the rioters are found guilty. Meanwhile, most of the Chinese are biding their time. Though the authorities do not prosecute any of the rioters for murder, at least compensation is awarded to the Chinese. £7,000. Not so much when divided by 2,000, 
but at least the wheels of justice are seen to be turning. One of those so compensated is Pan Look, who goes on to rebuild his store and his life in Australia. He survived that terrible riot. He was one of the ones who survived. Pan Look was my grandfather, which I say with great pride and love. Do you have a sense of the man that he was? I would say that he would be a very courageous man with what was ahead for him in his life there. If I could talk to Pan Look, my great-grandfather, I'd say thanks very much for going on that adventure. You know, it's because of you that we have this exotic and, and really strong um, feeling in our family of our Chineseness. Mm -hmm. And what about you, Nanette? If you could speak to Pan Look, what would you say? Oh, hello, darling. You've been in my heart all my life. Ever since I was a child, I would have loved to have met you. I'm very proud of you. I love you. Assured of their legal protection and buoyed by their compensation, the Chinese eventually do return to the Buckland. But something has changed. Such a major outbreak of anti-Chinese sentiment in the Victorian goldfields has opened up a debate about race. The Buckland riot and trial, a test of justice, proves that the sway of British law is holding in the colony. Just. The principle of freedom of trade and movements of people is preserved. Just. But the Rubicon of race has been crossed and the mob has selected its target, the Chinese immigrants. The Butler River riot is probably the first point at which the new Australian colonial regimes are basically saying, we are white, we are a race, we are not the same race, as the British, and our problem is the Chinese. And if we want to hold this space for ourselves, then that other race, that other incipient empire, has to be got out of the way. In the years following the events of Buckland River, the gold rush heads north, north to New South Wales. But the geography is not the only thing that changes in the next pivotal race riot. It's also the political landscape. We're going down to the basement. Right. The new chapter of Mayhem starts with a rare piece of archive. This riot will involve men, sabres and murder. And there's one fella caught in the middle of the lot. A politician who is immortalised in here on an ambrotype, an image printed on glass. Wow. So that's going to be our man right in the middle. That's right. The On C. Cowper, Premier, New South Wales, 1859. The image is fragile, just like a radical new idea. They call it democracy. One man, one vote. He was the guy that pioneered, in New South Wales at least, male suffrage, which is Men over 21 get to vote even if you smell. I think he was a liberal in the true sense of the word. He was pro-education, pro the vote. Mm. For yeah. men? For men, Goodness yes. sake, let's not get out of hand. No, we were about 40 years or so too early for women. Quite a unique period in mm. Australia's democratic history. And revolutionary in many ways because prior to that, if you didn't have 10,000 acres, well, don't even bother. What would you count? We run the show. That's right. Democracy has turned the tables for the white working-class man. Suddenly, what they think matters. And what do the miners want? To get rid of the Chinese. However, the elites don't feel the same way. And Premier Charles Cowper finds himself in a precarious situation. The debate hung between Liberals who argued if you could make the mob voters, then they would stop behaving in mob-like ways. And conservatives who said, if you empower the mob, 
you get mob consciousness. They can't possibly know what they're doing. Slippery Charlie, as he is known, must walk a fine line. Sniffing racism and resentment in the political breeze, Premier Cowper proposes a moderate bill to restrict Chinese arrivals. Mr Speaker, I move for a £10 tax per Chinaman that enters the colony. Cowper's bill shows that he's attuned to anti-Chinese sentiment while still allowing Chinese arrivals. And a majority of the members of the lower house say, Aye. 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 And then the matter arrives here, in the Upper House, a place filled with wealthy conservatives and pastoralists just like Charles Cowper. And suddenly, the outcome is not so clear. They like cheap Chinese labour. There will be no bill against the Chinese passed in this chamber. Cowper pronounces himself happy to let the matter drop. And yet, as he will soon discover, this is far from the last he'll hear of the Chinese problem. I think there would have been a real frustration within the miners and so in not getting what they need out of, out of legis legislative solutions, um, I think they decided to take it into their own hands. Three days ride west of Sydney at Lamming Flat, the largest of the New South Wales goldfields, the white mob establish a miners protection league. Fed up with the Cowper government ignoring their demands to restrict Chinese arrivals, they issue a damning prospectus and they encourage everyone, except, of course, the Chinese, to sign up. It seemed to them, every time they turned around, there was another hundred Chinese pouring onto the field. And for the first time, the miners felt the government really wasn't with them. It was one of the first unions in Australia, and it wasn't just about um, trying to rid this country of um, the Chinese. There was, there was more going on than that. They wanted a fairer deal for the common man. <laughs> One of the ringleaders is William Spicer, a fiery orator. He rallies the men against the government at a series of monster meetings. For their part, the Chinese know they are legally entitled to any piece of Lamming Flats diggings. But that doesn't stop the League pushing them off prime gold ground. Determined to keep them away, they issue a brazen letter directly to the Premier. It behooves the government to conciliate the diggers in order to avoid what would otherwise result in a dire calamity. In short, mate, if you allow the Chinamen to come back, then we are coming for them. A prospectus that denounces the government and demands to expel the Chinese? For Cowper, all this is getting out of hand. With an election looming, he thinks he'd better get to Lamming Flat and greet the miners himself, in person, press some flesh, smooth the way, politician style, with a handshake or three. He is, after all, Slippery Charlie. Lamming Flat, officially named Burrangong Goldfields, is a poor man's diggings. There's 150 new arrivals every week wanting their share. Lamming Flat would have been the wildest town in the world, certainly wilder than any American town. All the flotsam and jetsam of the world descending on it all at once. The louts, gamblers, blackguards, ex-convicts from Van Diemen's Land, the murderers. Would have been pretty violent and it would have been dangerous, but um, an exciting kind of danger. As Premier Cowper meets new gatherings of miners around the stumps and clumps of New South Wales, his opening remarks are always that he's on their side. This is Slippery Charlie at his best. He's their man to fight the battles against Chinese immigration, but it must be done by him in Parliament in Sydney, not by them with violence in the bush. You have our sympathy, he says, but we cannot permit the Chinese to be injured in person or in property. The Chinaman is here in the colony and must be protected just like the Europeans. At one gathering, William Spicer implores, Mr Cowper, please don't let the Chinese come back. He turns to the mob and says, who here is against the Chinese returning? Immediately, there's a forest of 2,000 hands pushed skywards. 
the Premier turns to the crowd, asks for more time and broadly promises, I'll stop the boats. Charles Cowper knew what they wanted to hear and he told them what they wanted to hear. So he's telling them one thing, but underneath would be thinking, you've got Buckley's, this is not going to happen. Confident he's done enough legwork to keep the white miners under control, Cowper heads home. He's sure there will be no more law breaking. The Premier's account of his visit to the diggings is widely reported in the press. The miners can't believe what they're reading. The diggers really have no reason to complain. The Chinese are not in any respect an annoyance to them. And most galling of all, the leaders of the League are not to be trusted. The miners called it a piece of goddamn flummery. After reading what he had to say in the Legislative Assembly, they were furious and they realised the government wasn't going to help them. And that's when all hell breaks loose. Early morning, 30th of June, 1861. 2,000 white miners in Lamming Flat goldfields stare up at a homemade banner emblazoned with the words, no Chinese. Furious that the government refused to preserve the diggings for the white man, they are resolved to do the job themselves. Led by a German band, the mob moves up the gully, looking for the first of the Chinese encampments, intent to secure the long tails of hair with which the Chinese adorn their heads. In a frenzy of fury, they fall upon their quarry and show no mercy. More than a thousand Chinese are viciously attacked. Some are even scalped. The Lanning Flat riots had more of an organised feel about it than the Buckland riots. You've got the banners. There's the cutting of the Chinese queues and pinning them to banners. There's more forethought um, and, and more violence. Two weeks after the riots, and it's Sunday again. But this is to be no ordinary Sabbath. Premier Cowper orders more police to Lamming Flat under strict instructions to ferret out the rioters. And they do it. They find three of them, they arrest them, and they bring them back here to the Lamming Flats police camp. Once again, the cry rings out around the digging. Roll up, roll up. And this time, no fewer than a thousand miners answer the call. They race up to the police camp, determined to liberate their comrades. The man in charge of the barracks, Captain Zouch, eyes off the troublemakers. As he steps out, a Welsh miner brandishing a pistol gives Captain Zouch fair warning. You better do as we say or there'll be trouble. Captain Zouch very calmly promises the men that the three prisoners inside will receive a fair trial. And nobody wants trouble, least of all him. As he turns to go, however, a volley of shots rings out from the miners. That's what they think of the law. Hurriedly, Captain Zouch calls to the troopers, men, disperse the mob. In an instant, the troopers on horseback withdraw their sabres and charge straight into the mob. That's what they think of rioters. Horses have been used for many, many years in all sorts of riot control because it puts the, the police and the military well above the rioters. So when they came in with sabres, it was a battle. blood loss, a lot of disfigurement, and a sight to behold. The cavalry charge eventually breaks up the miners. But for how long? 
Captain Zouch sends a message to the government advising that, in fear for the lives of his men, his troopers are withdrawing. Three bank managers also flee, taking all the gold. Back at the Premier's house near Sydney, Charles Cowper is in crisis. His faith that the miners would abide by the law has been shattered. Ever since his visit to the New South Wales goldfields, the Chinese question has turned into a personal and political battle of wills for him and the colony. A man of deep religious conviction, his need to balance his conscience with political survival surely sees him seeking some divine guidance here in the family church at Coverty. And so, the questions must swirl. How will his God judge him? What will the voters think? And when the gavel of history comes down, what verdict will it give? Is he on the side of right or wrong? It's a newspaper that best sums it up for the Premier. The problems can no longer be settled on the goldfields, but must be settled in the Houses of Parliament. Cowper dispatches more men, another 300 police from Sydney to Lamming Flat. The Premier also demands the arrest of the riot ringleaders, including William Spicer. However, this time he knows it's not enough. He needs to appease the mob. To survive politically, Cowper must act. For the first time, he starts making anti-Chinese commentary in Parliament and, most significantly, reintroduces the anti-Chinese goldfields bill, this time with the support of the lower and upper house. And on the 6th of November, 1861, it happens. An act to regulate and restrict the immigration of Chinese is passed. Thanks to the power of the mob, the idea first planted at Buckland River has grown at Lamming Flat and will bear full fruit by the century's end. Now, amazingly, this is the original 1861 roll-up flag, over 150 years old, with the Southern Cross as its centrepiece. Just seven years before the Lamming Flat riots, the Southern Cross flew at another rebellion, the Eureka Stockade. 27 miners died fighting for votes for the common man. But here's the thing. Whereas the Eureka flag represented justice, independence, liberty and multiculturalism, by adding no Chinese, they bastardised that whole notion. In this flag, you've got the first real manifestations of the white Australia policy, of big troubles up ahead for the country, most particularly for the non-whites. We think of legislation as something that's written by legislators in parliaments and in law courts and so on. But actually, what you see in this instance is the policy was made on a small piece of a canvas untidily painted by some rioters. And in many ways, that flag symbolises, epitomises, summarises all the legislation, all the policy, the many, many thousands of words that were to follow. Race as a ground for exclusion has become an ideal of our nation. In order to tell ourselves what we are, we have to define ourselves against them. We draw all the stuff we think about them, which is not us move them away and what's left in the middle is something pure and holy and white and that's what we are on january 1st 1901 the colonies federate australia is born and we are one of the most progressive nations on earth our constitution guarantees the vote for men and women and yet it is a white man's constitution written for a white Australia. Next time in the Great Australian Race Ride, the mob must defend the white nation they've created.
these were white men defending a white Australia. The whites think they're at the top of the pile. The Japanese think that they're at the top of the pile. So, of course, they're moving towards some sort of clash. It is an ethnic cleansing. It was a society in crisis. There was a palpable sense of, of fear. As the 20th century unfolds, mobs of all hues fight for their piece of territory. And among the most enthusiastic of these mobs, here's the surprise. Diggers from the Great War.